Football, cancelled. Rugby, cancelled. Netball, cancelled. The stadium's silent, but the noise is louder than ever before. This is about the summer of 2020 and where we go next. This is cancelled. Women's sport and the impact of COVID-19. The world is in an unprecedented situation, grappling with a global pandemic. The most vicious threat this country has faced in my lifetime. Huge implications across the world of sport. No footballing activity until April the 3rd at the earliest. All games will be suspended and postponed. It's looking increasingly more likely that that's going to be pushed back. Global sport in its entirety has either been postponed or cancelled. Everyone is praying for cricket, potentially behind closed doors. I have no idea what's going on. The Tokyo 2020 Olympics will be postponed for one year. The Netball Super League season has been cancelled as a result of the pandemic. They will not be allowed on property until they have returned a negative test. The Women's Super League and Championship were cancelled with about a third of the season left to play. We're not done yet. We must keep going. Premier League football is back. Back on top in England. I do feel like there could definitely have been more done to support the women's game. We can bring it back. And right now, that looks like a really big if. But after so many months, boxing is back. And I'm able to train, I'm able to smile. It gives you almost your identity back. To have their name behind it, which is what the women's game really needs. In order for it to keep growing, it needs to be out there. We've still got a long way to go. Hello everyone. 2019 gave us nearly 12 million watching the Lionesses in their semi-final with the USA. It gave us Dina Asher-Smith's Golden Doha and a home Netball World Cup. 2020 was meant to be another record-breaking year for women's sport. Then the pandemic put the world, and with its sports, on pause. But while money and sponsorship and heritage supported the men, would gender really divide sport? Over the next hour, we'll look at the impact of COVID-19 on women's sports. But this is more about where we go next. What's the ambition? And it's about you. Use the hashtag women's sport debate to be part of the conversation. It is about conversation, not just for us, but what follows. And that includes Hannah on The Reaction Show. Absolutely, Caroline. This is a conversation that affects all of us. And we've already been having plenty of debates across the Sky Sports socials in the lead up to this evening. So keep it coming because I've got a panel ready and waiting to react to everything that's said tonight, both on your show and on social media. Sue Anstis, Dan Ryan, Angela Ruggiero and Maggie Murphy will be unpicking all of it with me from nine o'clock. Thank you, Hannah. And the team, too. We'll hear more from Hannah later. But you've already been making your mark via our poll. We asked you over the past couple of days, what's the priority for women's sports to get back on its feet? Fairly conclusive, the fan base. You, everyone part of making that change. Well, let's kick things off in the company of a couple of World Cup winners from cricket, Ebony Rainford, Brent, and in rugby, Will Greenwood. Evening, both. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, I know that the fans are on full, the drinks are at the ready for some heated debate. So it, I say it's already started, not least that poll, but a, a tweet that we put out. We asked, has women's sport been hit harder by COVID-19 than men's sport? Some of the reactions that we got, and I'd love to know what you think about this, is because mm. it's as boring as bat, and then an expletive said one, and it attracts minuscule crowds. Another said, no, there weren't that many fans anyway, so proportionately, women's sport wasn't hurt at all. Nobody noticed. And not everything has to do with men versus women, says this other tweet. It's simple. They won't have as much viewers to help with their revenue. And this one just says, irrelevant then, irrelevant now. Ebony, why do we have to have this debate tonight then? Yeah, well, first of all, just uh, I did scroll down some of the, the Twitter yeah. comments um, and I have to say there was a, a few dinosaurs knocking about and I'd also question the role that all the women play in the people who made those comments lives. I think it would be pretty low. So I think they're not important in this conversation at the moment. The people who are important are the people who do care and the people who do want to see change. And then the one thing I do want to throw back to people who put those tweets out, and we'll get into this later, but for me, it's all about the data. We have seen a, such a shift over the last sort of five to 10 years around women's sport that I don't care what those people think. There are so many people ready. And I think this is more than ever a time that we need to make change. About change, Will? 
Well, you know, first of all, um, let's remove all those Muppets from the debate that you've just quoted and understand that uh, I looked up the word debate before I came on. A formal discussion on a particular matter in a public meeting where opposing arguments are put forward. But for me, we're not gonna, I don't think we're going to have many opposing views today other than those tweets you've written out because anyone with a fingernail of common sense can see the role women's sport plays uh, in our society. And I think what's happened on the back of COVID that while men have been given VIP access to the stadiums and the turbocharged manuals and the funds to get back on the field, women's sport has been left on the bench and disproportionately so. And we have to find a way to get women's sport back up and running so that they can continue to inspire the next generation so we don't lose a cohort with this sort of disastrous cancelled summer. Will and Ebony with us throughout the, the hour tonight and beyond for part of that conversation. It's not just about the, the decision makers. We will hear from those tonight, those with the power to make things happen. But it's about personal stories to the impact and where we go from here. Julie Flaherty has won everything in the women's game with Arsenal, with Chelsea, and now as captain at West Ham. She's spoken powerfully before about her own mental health, about suicidal thoughts. Now, as you'll hear, she's in a much better place, thankfully. But during lockdown, Julie's had to support her partner, Lily, through her own tough times. When we, we was lying there and it was like we was going to bed and, and she was just sobbing and I, she couldn't she couldn't breathe. It was her heart was racing and we were sitting there watching YouTube meditation and trying to listen to music and stuff. And it was then I realised, you know what, regardless of how I feel, whether I feel scared, whether I feel nervous, like I have to step up and be the strong one. Um, and she's still to this day, like she's still panicking that, one of us is going to get the virus and, and one of us is going to become ill and, and die and stuff like that. And it is hard. It's hard on my point of view because it's hard to see someone go through that and you feel so helpless and you're constantly trying to reassure them. But it's, it's something that sometimes only they know how they feel and only they can get themselves out of it. Um, but it is tough and it is. I'm, I spoke to my sister several times over, over lockdown about it and just said like, even if I am struggling, like, I have to be the one that, that stays strong for us. But my release was going out and doing my training program and getting my, when we was only allowed out for an hour a day, using the hour a day, literally using every single minute of the 60 minutes I was allowed out to, to make the most of it, to get fresh air. And unfortunately enough, I've got dogs as well. So for me to get out with them and just let them run and to get the fresh air really helped my mental health side of things. Is there a part of you that kind of feels a bit, you shouldn't even be in this, this situation? When you look at all that you've achieved, Jilly, on mm. the pitch, you look at the, the cups that you've won, the trophies you've won, the leagues that you've, you've won, to be in a situation where you're thinking, this isn't a, a job that financially I can be secure for my family. Yeah, I think it's difficult because we, we've, we've said it, me and my partner have had several conversations and we just said, if I was a man, I wouldn't even be, be worried. The level that I'm at, if you compare it to the men's game and the wages, but I just think, I, I don't personally think that's going to change in the sense of, I don't think we'll ever earn what the men earn, which is understandable in regards to, okay, we play the same sport, but obviously you're looking at it as a business point of view and the attendances, etc. You can understand the argument, but for me, I'm, I'm very fortunate enough that I can do this as a job and, and I can get paid um, paid to do it. Obviously, I've been at the part of the era where we had to work part time and and train in the evenings and play in the evenings. You're talking Arsenal. When I was at Arsenal, I was still semi pro playing the Champions League semi finals, for example, against Leon. But then I'd go back to work the next day as a PE teacher. Um, so we've been through two of it. But West Ham have been fantastic um, during the whole of the pandemic. Um, we had Zoom calls weekly. We, there was reassurance all the time in regards to wages and things like that. And we was completely looked after. So I felt we was in safe hands with West Ham. Beardy was fantastic with it. Beardy would text every player, message them, how are you? Um, just And asking just that simple question and not just asking it for the sake of asking it, but actually listening to the answer. And he, he was brilliant with it. Same with Jack. And But other players, I'm not too sure other clubs, if they knew of what was going on and, and, and where we stood with things. So I think for clubs, it's just literally, it's just, it's, it's being open, it's inter, inter-engaging with, with players and just feeling how our players feel, trying to find that, not just asking how are you and then letting them go, like actually genuinely ask them, how are you? And it's been up and down. And I went in the 
our general manager's office the other day and I just got so worked up, I ended up just crying. But I think it was, it wasn't about specifically about that. I think it was just the build up of like everything just went. And I think that's the main thing is just talking to players and, and asking them how they are and, and being there for them. What needs to be done to safeguard the future of, of women's sport, do you think? Of your game that you love? I think there was a bit of a frustration at the start because it was sort of like, are we going back? Are we not going back? Um, and in, in all fairness, I know a lot of fans were unhappy that we didn't go back. Um, and I know they said, well, the men have gone back. So why haven't the women gone back? But what fans don't realise is that we was having chats. All the captains from the clubs were having Zoom calls with the FA uh, to talk about how we felt as players. And we said, like, if it was maybe a month after lockdown had happened, we was back. You could probably get players back. But there was a lot of players with uh, out of contract. Um, there was a lot of players who weren't comfortable after having three months off to then go back and play two games a week. And I think, obviously, we're in a different position to them in financially where potentially if one of us got a serious injury and was at the end of our contract, where do we go then? Um, and there was a lot of people in that position. So what fans don't realise is that a lot of the players after four months of being off, weren't comfortable to go back. And the FA listened to that. The FA could have said, listen, you're going back and you're playing the games. But they didn't. They, they listened to the players and they listened to how think, we felt. Do you think if you had said as players, we do want to go back, that they would have found a way then to finish the season? Yeah, I, I mean, I think they, they were talking about protocols of in place and, and how they can bring us back safely. I think that was the main thing. We had doctors... Uh, Pippa Bennett on the on the Zoom calls, the head doctor, and we had all that medical advice from people to say, listen, if, if we go back, this is the route we need to go down. But they listened to the players. I mean, they could have just said, no, girls, you're going back, you're playing, whether you like it or not, you've got to finish the season. And I think that's what the FA done incredibly well. And I feel like they've, they've, they've got women's football in a very good place in this country. You're talking, it's like the number one league in, in Europe, if not the world, the way it's, it is. And... It's about protecting that and making sure that we do sustain it for the years to come, that in five, ten years' time, we've still got a professional, fully professional league going. West Ham captain Jilly Flaherty, uh, as he's been in touch using the hashtag women's sport debate, says, why couldn't the FA draw up a knockout tournament between the WSL sides like they did in US soccer? Well, Jilly kind of answers it there, says the FA listened to the players. A lot of the players weren't comfortable to go back. Will, one of the points that Jilly was talking about there, though, yeah. the UK at the moment is in a recession for the first time in, in 11 years. Should professional sportswomen be expected to be financially protected? Look, I think what happens when I've spoken to the agencies, the brands, the governing bodies, uh, and discussed this topic, what they're very clear about is that the marginal sports, the, the businesses who are operating the margins in times of crisis are those that are disproportionately affected. And when you look at it commercially, you do see the eyeballs and the revenue and the massive sponsorship deals tend to be driven by the men. However, Generation Z are starting to get associated with brands who have good purpose and have vision for what's going on. And that means doing the right thing. So those brands and those sports that can get themselves back on the field and do the right thing and play it forward is the, the words I buy from Sophie Goldschmidt, who used to be the ex-CEO of the World Surf League and at the RFU. Those that take a leap of faith will understand that it might be seen as an altruistic statement or uh, or role, but actually it will pay back in abundance with the enthusiasm, with the energy, with the participation, with the general health and well-being of all that those take part. Because are those I that you speak wanna... to within cricket, are, are they suffering at the moment? Are there those that, that are feeling the pinch? Yeah, massively. Um, you know, there's a, there's a few stories to pick up. One was a young player called Katie Levick, uh, from Yorkshire who came out in Twitter and it was picked up actually of the impact of losing the 100 contract for her, um, you know, really was going to be of significant importance. Uh, one thing you have to give credit from cricket's perspective, they did actually come out and put some retainer contracts in for the sort of first 25 players on the domestic circuit under the international game. And what I would say about this moment is, and you know, I think it backs up Will's point is under crisis, our values are questioned. We revert to old ways of working, the old default way used to be men's sport 
uh, and we've seen a shift. But now I think when crisis is happening, we have to really ask ourselves the question, what are you going to do with your values under this situation? Now, £1,000 a month could make a huge difference to difference to someone like Katie Levick staying in the game. I know when I was a player, you know, scraping around to try and get £12,000 to stay alive for the year just to compete, £1,000 could keep the game. And then you look at the male players who maybe have taken a cut, but that might be from 750000 to 500000 You know, in if we start to put things into perspective, I say at this moment when you ask yourself your values, if you're a chief exec or you're in a position of power and influence, are you really supporting the women's game? Are you really looking at the impact these things will have? So for me, it's a no-brainer. You've got to support. You've got to put behind money. And we've got to be inventive. Yes, there's not a lot. But when your values are questions at times like this, under crisis, are you going to make the right decision? I'm sort of hesitant to sort of stick my neck out as a male here and say, but understand that looking at some stats, 32% of women could not prioritise exercise during lockdown as they had too much to do for others. And when I spoke to Helen Richardson Walsh, the Olympic gold medal hockey player, she said it's, it, it's crises like these allow the old stereotypes relating to household chores to take root again and actually to be brave now and get women back out in sport. And we sort of threw something out on the podcast earlier in this week that. Uh, Men's rugby players, when they play for England now, get 25 grand a game. And it backs up exactly what Ebony is saying there, that it wouldn't, it, it, you could really lead the charge from the men's side of it, the men's players in the elite player squad, to stand by their sisters and understand that... I picked up a quote from uh, Kiri Irving, the Boston Celtics megastar. He goes, I wouldn't be anywhere without a great support system of women in my life. And I'm sort of I'm asking a question. Can you ask any male privileged athlete to think about that for a second? Remove the women from your life and tell me exactly how far you get. So sometimes I talked about paying it forward. On the other hand, you've also got to pay it back to people that got you there and understand they're in it together. You can't compare apples with apples, men's dynamism with mm. women's dynamism now. Men's sport had a leg up 30 years ago. We've got to help women's sport now. All right, we're off and running. Hashtag women's sport debate. Up next, one of those tasks with leading sport out of COVID and breaking news, how women's sport actually can make your money.
This is the Women's Sports Debate across Guy tonight. You can be part of it too. Use the hashtag Women's Sports Debate. Will Greenwood, Ebony Rank Brent still with me. This tweet from Lucy says a top issue with women's sport is that it doesn't have the support or the backing from brands who have the dosh, have the money. This is a prime opportunity for a forward thinking company to make their mark and step up and fund women's sport, much like Vitality do with netball. Well, you've been chatting to some of those yeah. that I guess hold those purse strings. Yeah. Yeah, I spoke to Katie Shaw, who's a partner at Fuse. She's a Chelsea fan since the age of four. Just backs up Lucy's tweet absolutely 100%. Women, she told me that women's sports are so much more agile and fle flexible and create genuine partnerships. The smaller stature, and I hope women take that the right way in terms of the numbers and the eyeballs that are watching. The smaller stature allows greater nimbleness to allow brands to get more bang for their buck. So now almost, if you're trying to put a positive spin in it, now is the moment now where brands, big spenders, have been hit by COVID and they have to find ways to be more agile. And historically, women's sport mm. through Vitality and Netball have been way more agile than other male sports. Oh, you teed that up yep. too smoothly, too smoothly. <laughs> Joanna Coates is now UK Athletics Chief Executive, but was responsible at England Netball for bringing in Vitality. Hi, Jo. Hi, Caroline. Go on then. Why is, why is women's sport good for business? Look, it's, it's fantastic for business. And I think we proved that with our partnerships with both Vitality and Nike. And it's great for business because it really opens, opens up those brands to brand new markets. That's the key thing. We are agile, exactly as Will said. There's probably not the restrictions that there are when you look at the male game. But equally, it really is about opening those new markets. We're talking to a brand new audience. You're talking to masses of women and girls who um, some of the people who probably replied to your tweets earlier around the uh, bat comment don't realise that women make up 50% of the decision makers in this country and brands want to get to them. We've seen that. I, I think I walked down to the, the copper box with you when England were playing netball there and you saw a completely different demographic to, to when I go and watch West Ham, for example, play in the, the Olympic Park. But are they spending that money? Yeah, absolutely, they're spending that money. I mean, a, an organisation like Vitality would not have review, re, renewed after three years and doubled their investment in the sport if it didn't give them a return. So absolutely, they're spending that money. And they're spending the money as well in Stadia um, if you get the offer right for women and girls. So, you know, make it an appealing offer. Offer the food and beverage offer that women and girls want to buy. Um, offer the merchandise they want to buy. We are brilliant shoppers. That's what we do. Um, so offer that as sports. And absolutely they will spend. And they will stick by the sports that have supported the sport that they love. But I do think as governing bodies, we have a responsibility to turn women into fans of sport. I think that's a really big responsibility for us. How do we do that? I mean, we probably need another four hours to talk about that. But it is about how we how we move forward. We spoke to Dame Sarah Story, uh, Paralympic swimmer, cyclist, champion, about what she wants to see from sport. And, and she talked about innovation, particularly the focus on football, about maybe playing men's and women's tournaments on the same day. We've seen the, the FA announce that. That's going to happen uh, from today. The Community Shield, both the men's and women's games will played at Wembley on the same day. So innovating and moving forward but whether it's also about maybe doing a bit more pushing a bit more well if i can bring you back in on on this uh, you sent out a tweet yeah. that you're going to be on the show tonight marco mira got in touch with us off the back of that and says how satisfied have you been with the support with governing bodies what could and should have been have been done well throughout this yeah, period so do you think the governing bodies have done enough so, I mean, the main governing body I picked up the phone straight away to with the RFU, and they maintained, like, like the, on the cricket side, their counterparts, they've maintained the 28 central contracts. They're, they're, they're very clear they're not going to increase spending in the next 18 months, but they are remaining with the status quo to maintain and retain their extraordinarily successful programme to make the Red Roses world champions in New Zealand in 2021. And they, they do understand that... Uh, exactly what Joanna's saying, that 50% of the decision makers, we're trying to get to 50% of the, the broadcasting uh, sports that are on TV are showing female athletes. 
And so from an RFU perspective, who've taken a bit of a kicking recently, I, I would support what they have done in their support for the women's game. Sevens, it's hurt both the women's and the men's game in terms of the central contracts. But the Red Roses are something that are supremely important to the RFU and England rugby moving forward. That's team sport, Joe. But how have you found it different or is it different when you move into the, the individual athletes that you're now dealing with at UK Athletics? Yeah, it's, it's very different. Um, obviously, the women and the men have complete parity when it comes to competition. So that's really unusual for me. Um, but it, it's fantastic. And I think they are a very forward thinking sport when you look at that. And also when you look at who our superstars are at the moment, you know, they are the women. They are really pushing forward. But equally, they've been hit because they get paid to run, jump or throw in, in major competition. And we haven't had that major competition. So although there is um, gender parity, it still hit the women extremely hard when it comes to no, no competition and therefore no payday. Ebs, what about with cricket? Yeah, look, there's a lot of positive things I have to give credit to cricket for. Um, you know, one thing we talked about, the retainer contract, um, which was put in place, um, and, and that forces the players to be able to come back. But the other thing I would say, and I, I think this is the bigger picture for me about making sport attractive, you know, I don't think we focus on the data enough. And what I mean by that is the uplift data, the data that shows how big the market is, how big the potential is to grow the game. Mm -hmm. Cricket, for example, over the last last year has seen some amazing statistics that to me blow my mind on can we invest more so an example would be um the icc 1.1 billion video views on the icc digital channel now if you're a sponsor and you heard that data would you not think straight away there is something to get involved with there's something moving you think about the 2017 world cup here that we had in in england which had a packed audience as well that on sky was the most viewed cricket game that summer um, I've just come back from Australia earlier in the year where there was a crowd of 86,000 people watching uh, one of the, the most watched female sporting events of all time. Now, I don't think we focus enough to make women's sport commercially viable and to attract the sponsor. I don't think we get the data out there enough. These numbers are powerful. You walk into any sponsor and you tell them this is what a sport is offering. They would snap your hands off if you also told, told them the layers under the spending power of females, the decision makers in the household. All of that sort of information to me is what mm. we need to be focused. I think under crisis now, we need to become super focused about making women's sport commercially viable on its own. I think we've done a brilliant job bringing it to this place now where the expectation high, the, the visibility is higher. But now more than ever, we need to be driving this data to all sponsors so that they know that actually women's sport may offer actually a better investment. And I know we'll talk about the Rose Series later, but you know, I didn't know much about American Golf and Commu Computer Center, but they're two people who sponsored uh, the Rose Series. And for me, I was like, that's a sponsor now that's on my mind. It's someone that I will see as a company with high values. They're going to get banged for their buck for putting their name forward. So the next phase for me is data, data, data. Start spreading the word about the massive opportunity that we're missing out on, and we can turn women's sport into much more of a commercial opportunity. And just to dive in there super quick, uh, Nikki Ponsford, who's the head of women's performance at England Rugby, this is so powerful for me. She said, long-term England rugby see the women's game as one of the long-term commercial drivers to help sustainability of rugby. Not women's rugby, rugby full stop. And the upside and the potential there is staggering. And it continually gets reinforced by the data. And yet we find ourselves having to push the water up the hill. But Joe, Joe who's the onus on then? Is it, is it down to you as governing bodies to go out and market yourself better then? I think it's a, a mix. It's up to us. I think the athletes do an absolutely fantastic job. And during COVID, they've done amazing things. You know, they've offered brands um, additional value for their money when we haven't got competition. So I think it's a I think it's a joint responsibility. It's the governing bodies. It's the athletes. It's it's kind of everybody pulling together. Um, but I, I completely agree about the fact that 
um, pre-COVID, women's sport was what everybody wanted to actually invest in. You know, if we looked at, we spoke to some people around the hockey situation and the women's game is the thing that they really want to go after, not necessarily the men's game. So I think we mustn't forget the point we were at pre-COVID. We were on an upward trajectory. Um, and certainly when I look at athletics and who, who big brands want to invest in currently, it is our female athletes. And we, we really mustn't forget that. But yeah, we all have a responsibility to keep it going. All right, Joe. thanks for coming on. Joanna Coates from UK Athletics, previously at England Netball as well. Zara writes, women's sports rights are indeed rich territory for brands, but it's not the job of the brands to commercialise the sports. NGBs and rights holders need to do a better job for de developing their commercial opportunities. Use the hashtag women's sports debate coming up. To be it, you've got to see it, right? How do you tell the story of sports superstars and how do you leave us wanting more?
We've got a poll running throughout the women's sport debate tonight on Sky, asking you if you're more or less likely to watch women's sport post-COVID on its return. At the moment, it's fairly even between less likely and the same, coming out pretty much in those middle of the 40% at the moment. Your views on that welcome, you can join in the poll via social media. Let's bring back Will Greenwood and Emily rainford Brem. We're also joined by Tammy Parler, CEO of the Women's Sports Trust. Hiya, Tammy. This, Hi. this question that we've been running has kind of morphed and developed as it will throughout this, this hour. Who in women's sport then is getting it right at the moment during the, the lockdown period and now looking to come out of it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone's getting it completely right. Um, I think we're seeing lots of uh, pockets of really good stuff and some really ex exciting things out there. And just today, uh, the FA announced that the Women's Community Shield was, was coming back and it's going to be at Wembley and it's going to be playing um, played on the BBC. And I think there's something really exciting there about um, football, uh, a strong brand like Barclays, and also broadcast the BBC. So I think there's definitely uh, definitely something interesting there. Then also the boxing with the, the, the Tasha, Natasha the Jonas headlining it and, and also Justin Rose and his wife and what they've instigated around golf. So I think there's the, the, the sports that have clear revenue streams, that um, have strong brand partnerships are definitely coming out. Uh, also some interesting stuff happening with the athletes that we can touch on a little bit later. Yeah, I know that the individual athletes and, and the progress that they're making, at least the conversation that's happening, has impressed plenty and, and opened different debates. But you mentioned the, the Rose series. It was the Rose Ladies series organised by, by Kate and Justin Rose after golf pros had nowhere to play. Kate spoke to Sky Sports' Jamie Weir about how the series was inspired by European tour player Liz Young's idea. This was an idea to set up an event at her local club. I spoke to Justin straight away and said this is something that, you know, the, the, the ladies haven't got any playing opportunities and, you know, him from a competitive point of view completely understood that that wasn't going to be great for them. Um, and me from a slightly more business opportunity kind of came at it from, you know, they're not being seen even, they, they've got no sponsorship opportunities if they're not playing. So, you know, with th both of those intentions, we kind of gave Liz a call and said, um, what, what help do you need? What can we do? And we talked about it and we said, well, can we make it bigger? How about a series, not just a one day? Would you like to do that? Should we do it with you? Or, you know, would you give us your blessing? And she loved it. So it kind of spiraled from there and then um, started calling some golf courses and, and we're amazed at sort of how positively the reaction, how positive the reaction was from everybody. Sometimes it's hard to look around and see who's struggling. And But when you have been shown and you do know, it's hard to then un see things so um you know the inequalities in in sport in general but particularly in golf between the sexes became very apparent once we kind of opened our eyes to it and so we were really keen to try and not level the playing field but at least shine a little bit of the light on the ladies i also say to the children especially our son it's not on the women it's not on just the girls to have to fight for their equality you know the the you're going to have to grow up knowing how to fight for equality even if it's not Benefic you know, even if it's not benefiting you particularly, it needs both voices. So I think we really, in a way, it's nice that Justin and I have kind of done it together because we really don't want to get into any kind of <clears throat> pitting the men against the female or any kind of conversation like that. It's a partnership, and I think that's where um, we really do need to work hand in hand. And together we can do more. That's just across the board in life, isn't it? let's try and give a little bit more playing opportunity. And what we've been able to do is a tiny amount. Obviously, it's just a, a short term stopgap when the players haven't had the playing opportunities. But hopefully with a bit of the coverage that we've received, um, it has shone a, a light and more people like, you know, Computer Center, American Golf, they they read the article that where we announced what we were going to do, thought well, that that's a value that we want to be associated with. We buy into that. That's totally, you know, we want to be part of that conversation. We want to be part of moving things forward and progressing things towards equality. So, you know, it's a step in the right direction. We'll take feedback from everybody. We'll look at the schedule for next year, certainly talking to Alex from the LET. Um, if there's a need for it, we'd be interested in seeing, but obviously in an ideal world, there isn't. It was a, it was a one, it was a little stop gap in a very strange year of COVID and no, and no tournaments. We'd love to be redundant. Um, if we're not, then we'll certainly consider it. 
pretty happy with the amount of firsts and having been able to just slightly nudge that door open for the ladies to, to step through. And I think they will. There's great stories. There's great players. It's on them now. It's their story. Kate Rose. And the golf does continue with the Ladies Scottish Open from Thursday here on Sky. Will, that's, that's the flip we're talking about it with Joanna Coates yeah. about individuals and the reliance on indi yeah. individuals and the financial pressure on them. Yeah, look, in the old days, all the messaging came out of the leagues. Now, I think the athlete the athlete has more power herself or himself. And we're so used to hearing the unbelievable stories of Venus and Serena, Megan Rapinoe, Alex Morgan. But what's beginning to happen now, if you certainly if you look at the NBA, uh, Steph Curry and LeBron James when the WNBA mm -hmm. relaunched, the NBA superstars were wearing WNBA jerseys. You're watching Andy Murray hire a female coach and Amelie Moresmo. You're seeing J Justin and Kate Rose. These partnerships that are coming together to understand we've got to support each other. There's always, why do we always make it so binary? Why is it always them and us? And actually the reality that if we have a common voice, a common narrative, if everyone's watching rugby, if everyone's watching cricket, then we grow together and much, much stronger. Tammy first and then you, Ebs. Do we have to force change? You've been working with individual athletes who open up the, the conversation and, and are they saying to you, we need that help, Tammy? We, we need someone to, to fall back on. I think we, well, we've been running a, an athlete program called Unlocked, which has taken 41 athletes to help them to try and understand how to, what they, what they care about and how to use their influence. We recognize that the women's sport platform and female athletes platform was, um, was, was growing. Uh, but we didn't necessarily feel that the athletes had um, really understood how to take full advantage of that. So we've taken 41 athletes across 26 sports and we've um, put them through a program and not only um, uh, brought them together to offer support and offer guidance and so forth, but also matched them with industry leaders as well. Because actually sometimes who you know um, is actually something that really can, um, can help, you, uh, help you in the long run. What we've noticed through this lockdown period is they've really come together and started to support themselves. And through that support and getting clarity around what they think and what they want to influence, they've really started stepping up more. So you've got people like, um, uh, like Sasha, uh, Sasha Corbin, netballer, who has started a YouTube series, a series about uh, inspiring people to, uh, with netball training. You've got Emily Defrond, a, um, a hockey player, who started a uh, Instagram live series called Capra and Anatta, and she's interviewing many, uh, many f uh, female athletes. Also, I think her last uh, guest was Claire Balding. Um, then you've got other athletes who are stepping off as activists, uh, a black swimmer, mm. Alice Deering, um, who started the um, black, uh, British, uh, the, I forget the name of it, the Black Swimmer Association. Um, that's all about raising, um, raising awareness around the barriers around black people face in swimming. Um, so, so a lot of uh, athletes just starting to, to step up and use their voice. Which, which is great, Ebs, but, but what if we don't know about it? What if we have to search around mm. to find their voice? What if we don't know this great content's there? I think, that, well, the, the one thing I would say that's exciting about the, the new era as such is, is social media and other platforms are there. Yes, I think as well, you know, you look at the Rose series, for example, that the message can spread not only through traditional channels of, you know, Sky got broadcast here, um, but also it will be picked up on social media. I think athletes now have a voice and, you know, they have following. Also, you can build community. So that's the other interesting thing now is you don't have to do it on your own. You can start a movement amongst other players. And so I do feel it's a really exciting time. I think crisis sometimes brings out the best. It actually challenges our values. I keep using that word, but our values. And as Tammy said, sort of, can you use your influence? Can you come together and create something? So look, I, I appreciate that, um, you know, not every athlete will be able to make a wave of change straight away, but a collective bunch of people who have the same vision for their game, their environment can come together and make change. And I think it's important athletes now know that it's a different world. There are so many mediums to get your message out there. And if other believe, people believe in you, they will join you on that, that path. So many questions still coming in. The debate doesn't end with us. There's another show after us with, with Hannah Wilkes and you can continue that conversation. Sophie says, great discussions, but if professional sports are struggling to get sponsorship from brands with big pockets, how can smaller and semi-pro women's sports hope to survive COVID? 
let alone grow. Well, up next on the Women's Sport Debate, we have the Rugby Player of the Decade and an England international too, as we ask, do we really know what our audience is? Andy says, using the hashtag women's sport debate, tonight's vital to get us talking and looking at ways all women's sports can grow and attract bigger audiences on the other side. As Joanna Coates said, sponsors as well will continue to play a huge part in this. Well, one of the most successful coaches in sport joins us next. Tamsin Greenway is a multiple Super League winner as a player and coach and now in charge of the Scotland netball team. Tamsin, does women's sport know its audience? I think... Um... <laughs> That's the big question, isn't it? Look, I think I've been listening to the discussion tonight and it's been really interesting. COVID, of course, has played a massive part in this, but I think we have to be realistic of where women's sport was before. When you look at netball, it doesn't have the backup of a men's game. So it's always had to go about this, uh, their spectators and their, their commercial side very differently. And one of the big issues mm. I find in netball is after the 
results at the Commonwealth Games winning in 2018, the first time ever. Um, the World Cup in Liverpool, we know we had a huge increase in participation. We have something like 340,000 women playing every fortnight. We have 1.4 million women and children playing across the season. They're the stats that come out. Yet, an average Super League game gets about 1,500 people if they're lucky. The numbers simply don't add up to people playing the game to people watching the game. And I guess that's uh, my biggest uh, bugbear at the minute is, do we even know who our target audience is? If it is actually the women and children that play, how are we addressing them? Are we looking at them in the right way? If it's not them, who are they? And how are we going to find it out? And I think we talk about data, and I know Ebony's been talking about that, and talking about sponsors and the numbers we can throw out at people. But the reality is, until we realise who that target audience is and help them watch the game and watch it in a way they want to watch the game, I think we're still going to be where we are. Um, I think the big thing for me, I talk about it a lot, is brand netball, the product. What does that actually look like in so many ways, whether it's merchandise, whether it's the venues, whether it's the entertainment, is it rule changes? Um, how do we address it on social media? If they're not watching full games of 60 minutes, how do we give them highlights and hits? And, and who are these people that are watching and, and how do we keep addressing them in different ways? And that's where we need to be far more creative. Chicken and egg though, isn't it, Ebony? Because like, you show it on telly, you want the sponsors, but you need people watching it to put it on telly. How do, how do you sort it? I think there's so much I just want to, I think that was a great point you just made, um, Tamsin, just about the fact that you, you relay those numbers and they don't stack up, right? You've got an audience, say, or playing, say, 1.4 million, but you look at who comes into the stands. And this is where I think data and I'll add insights become really interesting. Are we doing enough to unpick and answer those questions? You know, you, you look at, say, for example, the Women's World Cup final at Lords. Um, it got a crowd in, which was amazing. But interestingly, the alcohol stands weren't weren't being sold because that wasn't. It was a very different audience, a family audience, a younger audience, much more diverse audience. So questions to me as a result of that would be: Okay, what would we need to have in the stands? What offers? What sort of things would bring people more? And that we need to do is get insights. And and I, I completely agree. Without unpicking from the audiences. What is going to make you come? You're a fan. You maybe participate. Uh, you have a, a, a child that's interested. What's the next stage that will move you to the dial to witness? Does it have to look different? And the only way we're going to go about that is unpicking our audience. I think we've got to go deeper. What we do know is we're seeing signs of improvement in every area of women's sport. But I, think, I completely agree. We need to unpick to know what is going to move the dial to get people attending or people watching or tuning in more because the interest is there. I mean, I think one of the fascinating things there, without then therefore talking about that's the micro and the data of individual sports, if you go on the macro and remove, go apolitical, it doesn't matter who you support, surely health and well-being is at the forefront of any sort of social policy that any government or country would, would hope to have. Now, if 50% of the population are women, um, then why the heck not? You start to begin to understand about the possibilities of central intervention, from governing bodies or from governance to enforce uh, increased support and, uh, and sponsorship and perhaps broadcasting time in order to make sure you can't, it goes back to that, you can't be what you can't see. Who are the young girls, icons, talismans? Who are they following? And actually it comes back to, it almost doesn't matter whether it's netball or cricket, which the governing bodies rely on in the micro, but the big picture is, the support of women's sport is crucial for 50% of this nation's health. Yeah, I 100% agree. And um, Well, you talk about, um, I totally agree with all of that. And you talk about if you can't see it, um, you know, how are you going to be it? I think, you know, Sky Sports, for example, have been a huge benefit for netball. They took it on from the very beginning. They've promoted it above and beyond, given us so much time. They've started to put games on YouTube the messages I'm still getting is that people don't even understand it's on. And if it is on, and not perhaps wanting to watch sport in the same way as, as necessarily a, a male mm. football fan or a rugby fan will. And I think we have to be realistic on that. Um, we heard earlier about 
getting into the, the audience's mind and, and what they want. I know that a grand final held at um, the Copper Box next to Westfield is an absolute sellout for any netball fan because not only do they come down to London for the shopping day, they get to watch a great game of mm. netball, but the regular viewer isn't necessarily sitting through a 60 minutes talking about the game mm. in the same way. And I, I think I have experience in that. I grew up around football. I was taken to football age six with my dad and my brother. I was singing the songs. I was in on the referees. I was doing all that stuff. Netball games just aren't the same. Women don't tend to watch, not all, but majority don't tend to watch it in the same ways. And I still think we need the core of showing it on the sort of the matches and, and the full 60 minutes. But we also need to look at a different way of hitting. You know, does a sponsor matter if you get a million hits on a, on a two minute clip to a million viewers watching the grand final? I, I actually don't think they do. I think we've got to look at other ways of it being shown um, mm. to, to help grow that game. The, the good thing is that all three of you are on social media and I know you, you constantly have these debates because time has nearly beaten us on this part of the show. There's the follow-up show with Hannah coming up later. Just just 20 seconds from each of you then. What, what would you take away from this, the zip through of this hour that we've had, Ebony? Um, I think more than ever, um, we've seen the progress and I think everybody is actually pushed more to make a difference now. Now we need to capitalise. I think we need to take the data, the insights and sell better. I, I think the potential in the next 10 years could be much better, bigger than what we've seen. Well, Yeah, so I'm going to just pick on four of the people I spoke to and the things that really smacked me between my eyeballs. From Helen Richardson-Walsh, she just said simply, it's the right thing to do. Sophie Goldschmidt talked about paying it forward. The agencies talked about this is the right change, change, time for change, well suited for women's sport. And from the broadcasters, we've got to stand behind the women. All right. To be it, you've got to see it. We've all heard that tonight. Here is our commitment to that. Here's what's coming up on Sky over the next few days. We've got the golf, the first tour event and first major post-COVID. Then on Saturday, we've got live basketball, Storm versus the Wings in the WNBA. On Sunday, Jess on the football show will be here with the best guests from the WSL and beyond. And there's also the latest check on to check in to. You can be part of that conversation at Sky Sports. You can find out more on where we are and what we're talking about and be part of the debate as it follows forward. Thank you for all your company tonight. Thank you to our guests too. Hannah is up next. Keep that conversation going. Sport is sport. Sky Sports action. Feel it all.
Hello and welcome along to the Women's Sport Debate, The Reaction. We've just had an hour of pretty lively conversation around the impact that COVID-19 has had on women's sports and crucially, what we do next. We're going to unpick that whole conversation and all the reaction that's been coming in on social media during the last hour. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by a panel of sporting experts from across the sports sphere to help me do just that. I've got CEO of Sports Innovation Lab and its co-founder, Angela Ruggiera, all the way from the East Coast of the USA. We're also joined by founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust, podcast host and writer, Sue Anstis, MBE, and head coach of both Leeds Rhinos and Northern Ireland Netball, Dan Ryan. Thank you so much for joining me, all three of you. I know we were watching along that last hour as the conversation rattled along at quite some pace. Um, cast your minds back, if you will, to the, to the first part of the conversation that was had uh, between Caroline Barker, Will Greenwood and Ebony Rainford brenton and, and Will Greenwood made this point that I know you're very passionate about, Angela, and that was that brands with vision are the way forward for women's sport. Brands have got to have purpose and pay it forward because they will appeal to the next generation of sports fans. And that is what's crucial for women's sport to grow. So is this fluid fan idea that your sports innovation lab has, is this the way forward? Yeah, um, so we cover, all we do is study fandom at Sports Innovation Lab and how technology changes and how to better um, I was also a four-time Olympian in ice hockey, so I know a thing about playing. Um, the brands that have vision, the properties that have vision, uh, are the ones that are actually going to connect to this next generation fan, right? So um, you think about a think about a, a brand like um, Forest Green Rovers. I know it's a it's a it's a UK soccer or football team. They're eco friendly. They have fans from all over the world that may not even be interested in football. They may, they're just fans because they like that they're sustainable. Think about what's going on here, particularly in the U S some fans are um, better fans now because of uh, some of the social unrest of the teams that are um, supporting racial justice here. Right. So fluid fans, one hallmark that these, these new age consumers follow their values Right, you may you may actually buy a product at home because you like what that brand stands for. The same thing is translated in sports. The fluid fans may follow new teams, new leagues, and the properties and sponsorships that actually understand that and partner with women's organizations, women's properties um, are going to actually connect to that new age fan. So it's a it's an evolving model. And whereas this the old fan would might just watch for sports sake. The new fan actually has other considerations that go into um, what they watch and what they consume. And this ties in as well with a poll that we ran before the program, asking people what they think is, is the biggest factor in women's sport recovering from the pause enforced by the pandemic. And, and the overall winner for that was that it's about a fan base. It's about attracting fans and growing fans. Um, Sue, you've been involved in women's sport in the UK for, for a long time, granted an MBE because of your services to women's sport. How have you seen that fan base change since you've been involved in women's sport in the UK? And what does the future look like? Do you buy into this fluid fan model? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's beyond, I think sometimes there is a bit of a, a preconception that it's just women that are watching women's sport. And actually, and there was some Nielsen research out in 2018 showing, uh, you know, about 60% of, of sporting fans, men and women, are keen to watch more women's sports. So uh, I think sometimes it's a bit of a danger that, that we just said it's, it's the women and women and girls that want to watch more of women's sport too. But absolutely, we, we really have seen that grow. And I, I know the polls said it's very much a, about fans and, and that needs to be driven further. For me, it all starts with visibility and exposure of the sport and the way in which sport is filmed and, and broadcast, that quality we need to see on the women's sports side that sometimes we don't see it's a, a simple way of streaming it to fans that may be very keen and passionate and happy to tune into um online to watch their sport but really uh, often the package that it makes people appeal to sport is seeing it really well filmed great graphics great commentary the build up of athletes before and after a game you know understanding that's all important to the fan the new fans not just those really uh, passionate fans that we know love women's sport We'll talk more a little bit about the product and the coverage later on in this hour. But on that male allyship, like I said, doesn't, women's sport doesn't just appeal to women. And Will Greenwood talked a lot about the need for men's sport to stand up and, and support women's sport because they had a leg up 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now it's time to help out. 
how important is male allyship and do we need to see more of it or, or is it something for women's sport to take responsibility for and drive its own growth to see? Yeah, absolutely. I feel very strongly on the male ally side. I, I've never quite agreed Greenwood as much as I have this evening. I was nodding a lot of lots of things that he said this evening. Um, but I definitely think, you know, you've got those really strong male allies, the likes he mentioned, and Andy Murray and others that have Pep Guardiola calling out the sexism in women's sport. But actually, it's male allies across the whole of sport, whether they're CEOs, whether they're broadcasters, newspaper editors. Uh, so I think it's it's far more than just uh, the male allies that we see in terms of elite athletes, it's at every level. And again, you know, that calling out the Muppets on Twitter that we see uh, passing negative comments, which we see every time, you know, there's a mention of a women's sport, where every time I'm sharing information, there's negativity. So I think there's a bit of a, a role for men to step up and step forward and call out that negativity as well. So there's lots that people can do. Uh, you know, they may not be the owners or the CEOs, but I think men at every level uh, can play their part in helping to redress that balance for women's sport. Well, Dan, you are a head coach in netball, which is obviously a female-dominated sport. With the issue of male allyship, do you think netball could be missing an opportunity because it, it is a sport that at the elite level around the world where it's played, it is it is women. Is it something an opportunity missed, perhaps, netball not to be more closely aligned and to expand who it appeals to? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, men are enormous stakeholders in the game of netball. They're very loyal fans. There's coaches. They play at the highest level. However, I guess they're not necessarily recognised by governing bodies. And uh, although they're involved in all different levels, in all different roles and departments of the sport, is there perhaps a source of revenue, a new level of stakeholder that is untapped by our sport that actually could, I guess, increase power in numbers? And I think the power of a sport often comes down to the numbers in their participation at all levels. Um, and perhaps netball is missing an opportunity there. However, I guess what some countries done, particularly New Zealand, has really embraced the men's game and made that a product as well to further enhance the women's game. And I know there's been a lot of talk in Australia in, in, in recent years that perhaps there's a, they're a little bit threatened, I guess, by the men's product. However, this is where netball really needs to show its confidence in its own product and stand on its own two feet and be bold in the product that it does have and be confident that it will always stand the test of time as a female-dominated sport. But men do play it as well, and perhaps more of the men involved can have a greater enhancement of the sport overall. Like you, you yourself are doing. And um, we're getting lots of tweets in on the women's sport debate. Let's take a little look at some of those that we have been receiving in in the last hour and a bit since the conversation started earlier this evening. And there have been plenty of them. Lucy Wildhart um, said, tune into Sky Sports and watch the women's sport debate. Thanks for watching, Lucy. It's great to have the difficulties in women's sport discussed. And it's great to see women's boxing headlining last weekend at Matchroom Boxing, which is a step in the right direction, alluding there to the fact that Natasha Jonas and Terry Harper headlined the bill last Friday for their first ever all-British women's title fight. It's that kind of visibility that we're excited to see the sport comes back. So let's see what else has been coming in from all of you watching at home. Like I say, Conversation's been blowing up on Twitter. Uh, this one from KLH Matthews. Favourable scheduling and broadcast opportunities is vital for the growth of women's sport for audience growth and sponsorship value, but also for the grassroots. Girls are inspired by seeing elite female athletes on TV and girls need more sporting heroes. And this ties into what you were saying, Sue, about visibility, about media coverage. So we'll pick up on that in just a moment. Have a look at one more before we continue the conversation. This one in from Sean Foley, watching the women's sport debate and I've just renewed my England membership. That's England netball membership. Cannot wait to be back on court with my girls at club and get cracking. Part of Rhino's netball too. Dan, that'll make you very happy, I am sure. <laughs> <laughs> but now I, wanna, I do want to pick up in terms of what we call the agility of women's sport. It was a conversation that, that came up during that first debate and something that Angela, I know we've seen a lot of agility around women's sport in the US with the NWSL coming back for any professional sport and running their Challenge Cup. Um, agility is key, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think in business terms a lot, um, a startup has enormous flexibility, right? There's And it's not always going to be the best product. Think about women's sports in terms of a startup. It's not always going to be perfect, but it, it is very agile. It's more willing to create unique partnerships, Whereas the behemoth big business, men's sports, right? They have their long-term rights fees with their sponsorship, with their broadcast. They, they have, you know, players unions. It's very hard to move that ship. Women's sports, 
totally innovative, more flexible, more amicable to these innovative approaches. So we talked a little bit about athletes have so much more power now they can go direct to consumer. Well, women's athletes have even more flexibility. Sponsorships, right? They're they're all about co-creation of partnerships and getting more value and ROI versus slapping a logo on the wall. Well, on the male side of the equation, that's what they've got. The asset women's side, again, having this um, more open conversation. Think about your broadcast rights. Maybe on the men's side, they've sold them. On the women's side, they don't have any long-term rights that they're tied to. So think about digital partnerships, social partnerships, things that are outside of the typical linear broadcast. So there's an enormous amount of flexibility in the business model of women's sports because they're new, because they're younger, and they're more like a startup business. They need more investment. They're not perfect. They've got a ton of um, flexibility, but there's also a lot of upside. And that's how I always think about women's sports is, yeah, it's not a perfect product today because it hasn't been invested in, has, you know, decades of investment fandom that's been created, but they are perfect partners to start a league. If I had, you know, money today to deploy in sports, I would hundred percent put it in women's sports because you're not going to see it today, but that longer term return on investment, I think it's it is about that long-term vision isn't it, as we bounce back. Great stuff, guys. Unfortunately, we've got to take our first break. Um, but before we do, we have got a poll running on Twitter. We want to know how likely you are to watch women's sport as it returns from lockdown. We've seen the start of it returning. We want to know if you're more likely, less likely to watch women's sport, or if you'll watch it at the same level. Don't go anywhere. The conversation will continue in a couple of minutes.
Welcome back to the Women's Sport Debate Live Reaction. Still alongside me, Angela Ruggiero, Sue Anthony and Dan Ryan. Don't forget, we want to hear from you. We are very much reacting to everything you've had to say this evening. The hashtag is Women's Sport Debate on Twitter. Make sure you have your say. Um, now, lovely panellists, I want to tell Clash your mind back once again to the, the early part of the debate previously that we had, we had this evening. Ebony Rainford Brent, quite impassioned on the power of data in women's sport, how it's not being utilised, and the spending power of women and women's sport, therefore the opportunity it presents. She said that women's sport needs to be commercially viable on its own. And Sue, like I've said before, you've been involved in, in women's sport for a long time. You've seen the development of it and the growth of it in the UK. Are we getting to a point where women's sport is commercially viable as its own entity, independent of, of women's sport or anything else besides? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I think I mentioned, Joe mentioned, didn't she, about the likes of Vitality, uh, Barclays in the FA, WSL, uh, SSE, et cetera. There have been so many brands that have come and, and had great success. And I think I loved Ebony's point in terms of women. I think some of the stats say women drive 70 to 80 percent of all purchasing decisions in a household. So as a, um, I remember the, a guy from Kia when they sponsored the cricket citing a huge, I think it's like 60% of car purchases, you know, women are, in, women are involved in those decisions. So I think those are probably some of the stories we need to be better telling, those commercial sponsors that have come and invested in sport and seen a great outcome, you know, is the reason uh, that they keep coming back and, and spending more. So perhaps it's to tell more of those stories in terms of the opportunity that they've seen in, in women's sport, that we can try and drive more sponsors to, to come to the sport. Angela, women's sport in the US often feels miles ahead of, of in the UK. You look at the likes of the NWSL and the WNBA. Is women's sport much more commercially viable and, and supporting itself in the States? I would just say the, the model is um, it needs to stand on its own. Obviously, the WNBA has the NBA, but um, I think the American model is approach it as a, any other business. Get those sponsors, get those broadcasters Maybe we have that nimbleness we talked about before, but um, but it certainly is. Let's build a, a very entertaining business. At the end of the day, sports is entertainment. Women and men are equally entertaining. We just haven't had the same amount of investment dollars put into it. But I spent uh, eight years on the International Olympic Committee. I was on the, ex the executive board there. Um, that's the biggest brand in the world for sport. And 50% of those athletes starting in Tokyo are women. And when you're talking five, $6 billion budget, we're 73% of that budget comes from broadcast rights, roughly 18 sponsorship rights. Those, those, those broadcast partners are investing in equally men and women. So there's a market out there for it. America obviously is very commercially driven. So our, our models are all about let's build the business. Um, and, you know, there's huge opportunity. It's just who's done it well and who's actually long-term view investing in women's sports are going are gonna, to uh, achieve the ends you see at the IOC level. I'm glad you mentioned, you know, people wanting to see women's sport on TV and, and the big being a big broadcasting opportunity there because Emma Patton from Sky Sports News spoke to Sally Mundy, the chief executive of UK Sport on that very subject. Here's what Sally had to say. I really believe that it's just a blip. And I believe that because what we heard for such a long time until recent years was that people didn't want to watch women's sport. And I think what has been proven in the last few years and it probably started at the London Games, but then carried on through what we saw at Rio and then some of the events that you've talked about. You know, and the event that I was involved with in my previous role at hockey, where we had over 100,000 people come and watch live hockey at the World Cup in 2018 in London. People do want to watch women's sport. And I don't think just because we've paused, that's going to stop. I think people have had a taste for how brilliant women's sport is live and on TV. And I really am optimistic that this is a moment in time that we've got to get past and that we will then rebuild on the momentum that we'd seen before. And what I don't want to happen is I don't want us, I don't want us to talk ourselves into there being a backward step. Uh, I want us to talk ourselves into the fact that we've got to use this platform. Every challenging situation is an opportunity. And I think women's sport has got to grasp the opportunity of what's in front of us and build on the momentum that we were seeing pre-COVID. Interesting what Sally was saying there. Dan, being in netball, a sport that does get eyeballs on it in this country when it is broadcast, broadcast the, the Vitality Netball Super League, 
we know there's a market there for, for women's sport on TV. When we live stream the Vitality, uh, Vitality Network Super League matches, the videos reach 800,000 people. How much more can we do to grow that? And what do we need for something like netball to push on? We know the market is there. What's the missing link? Yeah, the market is absolutely there. And we've seen the rise of the sport since 2018. It's just, it's grown enormously. And we're seeing the sport grow even bigger in Australia and New Zealand. However, I guess what this opportunity with COVID has provided for England netball is, I guess, to take stock at where their priority sits with the Vitality Netball Super League and the investment that they make into that competition because that competition really is the most consistent visible product we have of netball week to week throughout the year. We see the Roses a handful of times throughout an international calendar, six, seven test matches a year. That's really not enough. We need that consistency week to week. However, the way that the funding is distributed or lack thereof, should I say, into the Super League franchises and the way that the franchises are set up through their infrastructure, their governance systems, their financial streams. They were never going to survive a COVID period. So the competition was never going to get off the ground again because all clubs run independently and run very, very different. And I think what a really important stage now for England Netball to do is to shift their thinking around what is the Vitality Netball Super League for us. And we've mentioned it here before. It needs to be a premier business product to promote our sport at the highest level on a week-to-week basis. And rather than seeing it as a participation competition and diluting it by it being funded by community and grassroots, we need to get funding from governing bodies. We need to get funding from government into the franchises lift salary caps so players can earn more money and ensure that we're actually operating like business people, not volunteers who are happy to be involved in a club setup because that's where I think women's sport can struggle slightly at times is if we do blur the line between what is participation, what is truly elite, what is high performance and what is a business product. And the premier sports in the world, like we mentioned just before again, they are premium business products, they are entertainment packages. And a little bit of work I think needs to be done behind the scenes to ensure that the Vitality Netball Super League becomes that and that we see it more than just one game a week and we see and we don't follow the series or the entire season on Twitter which is what a lot of fans have to do and that's no way to follow an elite professional branded competition so I think take stock right now and let's address some issues in our infrastructure to see if we can make really professional progressive gains in professionalizing the brands and the products that we put forward as our, as a part of our sport. Is the onus then Dan as far as you're concerned in sort of netball's viability and ability to withstand something like this if it were to happen again, which of course we we hope it doesn't, is the onus on the government then for women's sport? Because, you know, you've mentioned that the funding structure in netball and that government fund the roses, that's why we see a lot more of them and they can survive this. Do they need to readdress and reassign those funds? Well, the only program that I guess was... Uh, invested in or funds distributed to ensure a return to play was the full-time England Roses program. So there was none of that, none of that happening at a Super League level, which brings me back to my point that we were never going to get off the ground in the season. It was impossible to resume it. So while we see the Roses as the premier product, which as it, as it should be, people now know who the England Roses are, which I think is absolutely sensational. However, we now need to know, we now need everybody to know what the Super League is about. We need them to know every single player in every single franchise. We need to know who's signing with who, who's moving to what other club, who's coaching where. We need to get those stories out there and we need to get them out there more consistently and be bigger and bolder than just you know, reporting on news results or this game beat, this team beat that team. We need to get the characters out there, the controversies out there, the rivalries out there because they exist. And that's probably the most important the sport the sport needs to do moving forward over the next couple of months because um, there's a lot happening in that space and the sport to thrive and for it to become a business product, they need to take those aggressive steps forward and more funding needs to come from the top. And we also, most importantly, need a streamlined model where all franchises operate in a very similar fashion so that if a crisis does happen, we're all in the same boat and not one club thriving and one club drowning and then the whole competition is over. So there's a lot of work to do in that space, I think. Yeah, there certainly is. And we've seen it with, with the Super League. We've got clubs crowdfunding and asking uh, fans to donate the ticket season money. Um, 
We're going to take another quick breakdown. I know you have to leave us at this point, but thank you so much for joining us this evening and for that insight. Best of luck with Leeds Rhinos netball. Um, I know you've got a lot of work to do to get them out on court ahead of next year's Super League season. That very much starts now. Uh, after the break, we'll be joined by Maggie Murphy, the general manager of Lewis FC, and continue to react to everything that's been said and you guys are saying as well on Twitter in the women's sport debate. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the Women's Sport Debate live reaction. Our poll is still ticking along on Twitter. Let's take a look at how it's doing so far. We've been asking you if you'll be more likely, less likely, or will watch the same amount of women's sport as it returns from lockdown, as it is starting to do now. This is how the numbers are breaking down so far. 13% say they're more likely to watch women's sport. 42% interestingly say they're less likely to watch it. 
And of 45% of you, it will be the same level that you consumed it at before. Um, we've been joined now by Maggie Murphy, General Manager of Lewis FC, the first professional football club to pay their men and women's players exactly the same amount or pay them equally. Um, Maggie, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a, an interesting hour and a half of debate across the two shows this evening. What's been your reaction? Because there's been a lot of conversation about parity. We heard from Jilly Flaherty in the first show um, saying we'll never be paid the same as men, not the case at Lewis, but something that long term, will we see a level playing field in football or is that likely to, to remain true? Yeah, uh, Jilly was great. A uh, lot of respect for her. I, I thought it was interesting that she said that she hoped that in five or 10 years, there would still be a professional league and um, that, you know, maybe we could make more progress in in salaries. Of course, at Lewis, we have split our budgets equally. So we do do this already. Um, and I think that, you know, clubs can sometimes hide behind this idea that progress will come naturally. There will be a trickle down effect and eventually women's uh, sport will grow and rise. But I think every club out there has an opportunity to check their policies and practices and actually look at what their academies are doing or what their under eights, what their under tens, what their under fifteens are doing and maybe start with equality a bit further back um, rather than thinking, well, we're never going to hit the equal salaries right now. Um, so we're never we're not going to put a plan in place. It's, it's too difficult for us to do that. For women's football, there's often we talked earlier actually in this uh, in this program about the need for for women's sports to be independently commercially viable. For women's football, the teams are often not always, but often tied quite closely to men's teams. And I know it's something that you've had to sort of fight against before in players being approached to go to you know Manchester City women or Arsenal women that are more closely tied with a, a big name men's team. Is that the way forward for? women's sport to grow to align closely in terms of football at least because in some sports mm. we can see being a bit more independent is an advantage but for women's football is that the way to go well I actually think that there's a bit of a danger in this urge to professionalize and get uh, huge amounts of money in straight away or demand more from women's football teams demand more from women's sport that what will happen is the only option is that the big Premier League clubs just tag on a women's team and that's quite dangerous because the people that make the decisions are not always uh, making decisions on behalf of the clubs like us that have been working at this for a very very long time in other clubs as well I think one thing that really stood out to me was this idea that men's football and men's sport have kind of got to where they are all by themselves, as if like independent market forces run professional men's sport. And that's not the case. There has always been more investment uh, in men's sport and men's football. There's always been more uh, taxpayers' money in men's football. And so I, what we're looking for is, is a ramping up uh, of investment into women's sport to be able to kind of uh, catch up. Uh, that one extra point on that is around this idea of an an ecosystem of football, um, because I don't want to make out as though all men's football is super rich. In fact, really, the, when we think about football being wealthy, it's only really the Premier League and maybe the men's championship. And the rest of clubs are suffering. And there are definitely one or two things we could be doing, uh, especially in the way the FA Cup money is allocated, for example, uh, that would help those grassroots clubs that are really suffering right now, especially with COVID, um, and would definitely help women's football. And that's investment that can come from our governing body, from the FA. It doesn't have to come uh, from elsewhere. Well, in terms of investment in women's football and women's Super League more generally, uh, we spoke to Manchester United women's head coach, Casey Stoney. This is what she had to say. It's about visibility. We need somebody who's going to raise the visibility of the game to make sure that we're getting more bums on seats, you know, and that, that's my argument is we can start paying players more money when we start bringing more revenue in, when we start getting more bums on seats, when we start making sure this game that people want to keep paying to come back and watch. And that's what I say to my players. Let's create an advert out there where people want to keep coming back and paying to watch us because we excite, we entertain. Um, so, yeah. Listen, it would be lovely to be part of a Premier League brand, but I also think it would need to be done in a separate arm as well because, you know, it, it's, it's a big thing, this WSL now, in terms of running it, managing it, and making sure that it, it's effectively run. Um, and one of the things is to make sure that we don't clash with men's Premier League, which is very difficult when... <laughs> There's games pretty much every day of the week now, but trying to make sure that we don't clash is important. 
uh, making sure that we market the game. I think there needs to be more money put into that. It's important and, and raising the visibility, but that's just not women's football. That's women's sport in general. Interesting there to hear from Casey Stoney on, on the importance of a good product on putting bums on seats and marketing the game more effectively. So what do you think is the key to getting people watching women's sport at the grounds as well, not just on TV? Yeah, I, I do feel this um, myth still that exists that the women's football and, and women's sport generally isn't of the quality of men's, that we hear that a lot on social media. And actually, even in the last five years, if you look at the professionalism of women's football and cricket and rugby and, all, and netball, all these sports that have now, you know, they're not playing twice a week and expecting to play at that standard. They're now playing every day in their training. So the real quality of the product has transformed in recent years. And I think that will only keep on improving in the future too. So there is no reason uh, why people shouldn't be as enthralled and entertained by women's sport as they are by men's. And I think Kate is absolutely right. It's about letting people know that, getting people to see the product. And people may have seen the product maybe uh, 10 years ago even, but to people to see the product now and to understand. And, and I guess the point earlier, you look at Olympic sports, you know, don't care whether it's triathlon or rowing or gymnastics, you wouldn't think the women's product was any lesser than the men. So I think it is about educating people, getting them to come and see this amazing quality of the product uh, that is out there as women's sport. It's, it's interesting with the product side of it as well, because that's what we've been talking about the whole way through. Interestingly, though, in one of the big women's sports stories that we've had over the summer, it's the launch of the NWSL's expansion team to Los Angeles, Angel City. And what they're doing is very much not just focus on the product and focus on the pitch, but what they're doing beyond that. And earlier this month, I spoke to Julie Ehrman, their president, and here's what she had to say about what they were doing and about the driving force behind them being a majority women-led team. It's really exciting to us that it's all women because we all have the same sensibilities as far as wanting to make an impact, but you know, not just on the sport, but on our community as well. When we announced that we had the rights to bring a professional women's soccer team to Los Angeles, we also announced our partnership with the LA 84 Foundation, which uses sports to address social justice in um, brown and black communities here in Los Angeles. And we hope to announce our first partnership with them in the next one to two months. Um, we also want to think about pay equity and how do we get these players paid and how do we you know, make it so that they can just make a living playing soccer and don't have to do other things to supplement their income. Um, and that some fans want content off the field. They want 90% just to know the players, know their stories. Yeah, I want to see them play soccer um, or, or football. But the way that you actually create that content, share that content, fluid fans, I don't care, men's or women's sports, they look very different. They want very different things. And that provides an opportunity, again, for women's sports to do things differently. And I just have to throw the statistic out there. In the US, the Women's World Cup has more viewers than the Men's World Cup. Yes, the women in the US won the World Cup, but it just shows that uh, uh, football, the biggest sport in the world, in the US, there are more women, there are more fans, men's and women fans. So it's possible. It's just, again, you need the right dynamics and the right vision. Yeah, you need the right engagement. And we can see actually just how big the fan base is for women's sport in the US. If you look at how the NWSL came back and the WNBA, look at these audience record viewing figures that they set during lockdown. The NWSL Challenge Cup final reached 653,000 people, up almost 300% on last year's final. And the WNBA, their opening match uh, was the most watched opener since 2012, up 19% on last year's opener. Does this highlight, Sue, the importance of fan engagement, re-engaging fans as female sports return? Because we're seeing women's sport come back now in the UK. We want it to be thriving. We want it to grow. It's getting the fans involved. The second they take the pitch to the green, to the ring, to the court, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm a very glass half full person, but I'm really positive. I'm really excited. I'm glad you shared those statistics because I had those to, to share later, some of those, those numbers. And the WNBA draft was hugely up again this year as well. So I think I feel really excited about uh, we've almost missed this women's sport. It's, you know, it's not been on our screens and so on. I think it's almost made us realise how much more we appreciate it. And I, there's a really positive, I spoke to Frank Connolly today from um, England Netball, and it's great to hear that netball and cricket and rugby and hockey and football have all been, all the women's sports have been meeting and talking and loads of, I think, collaborations really happened in this period. I know 
and Maggie can talk for herself, but Maggie's been talking with colleagues over in Australia and New Zealand. And so I think within all these different groups, the Women's Sport Trust has got a group with Ambition Project together, sports rights holders and sponsors and national governing bodies. So I think people are, are very excited. It's it's uh, easy to look on the negative side and it's almost a bit self fulfilling that we think we're going backwards but actually there's lots of conversation like never before have people come together and, and been planning for the future so I do feel uh, both fans and those involved in the sport is an exciting future ahead. Yeah definitely reasons to be positive we saw it last Friday as well with the return of boxing in the UK and Natasha Jonas and Terry Harper topping the bill uh, for the fight camp out in Essex and we're going to take a quick break and after which we're going to bring you the results of our poll as to how likely you are to be watching women's sport as it returns after lockdown we'll continue the conversation in a couple of minutes
Welcome back. This is the Women's Sport Debate of the Reaction. I'm still joined by Angela Ruggiero, Sue Anstis, MBE and Maggie Murphy. Uh, we're still running the poll on our Twitter account as well. We'll bring you the results of that very soon. Don't forget to have your say, of course. You've still got some time at the Women's Sport Debate. Uh, now, a couple of times this evening, we've, we've heard mention of the Women's Sports Trust Unlocked Group. It's a set of 25 athletes, that, that female athletes, that the Women's Sport Trust has brought together uh, to help them to connect with each other, to develop their personal brands and grow as individuals. Um, one of those athletes who's been doing very well in the enforced pause, pause of the pandemic to grow her brand and to push the agenda on topics she's passionate about is Alice Deering. And I spoke to her a little bit earlier on this month about things that are important to her and the privilege of being a swimmer. I thankfully never had to say, oh, I'm a woman swimmer or I'm a female swimmer. Whereas I feel like basketball players, football players, like all the sports where rugby, for example, where the men's is more dominant than the women's, they have to say, oh, I'm a woman's, I play for women's rugby. And it's kind of like, oh, it's just, it just, it doesn't sound right to me. Like saying I'm a woman's swimmer just doesn't sound right. But from my point of view, I kind of want to use the, the privilege that I get as a swimmer of being on the same stage to be like, look, can't we just have like football? I will call it men's football and women's football. Like, I just, it's, it's little things like that in the language that just takes away from women's sport and I hate that I have to say women's sport I wish I could just say sport it's that same thing with the black swimmer and just just want to say swimmer it's the language we use it's interesting isn't it because we still call it women's sport we're having the women's sport debate we've got the women's sport trust Angela Rugby, and you're on the World Rugby Board, is taking a step forward in this direction by dropping the women's from Rugby World Cup from next year. That's an important step forward, isn't it? And also a sign of respect to audiences that you're going to look at the year and you're going to know which gender are playing the sport. How did the World Rugby Board come to that decision and why do you think it, it's so important? Yeah, I think, I mean, World Rugby wants to um, put a stake in the ground and we're, we're serious about about investing in the women um, and and the men, right? And so you either say men's and women's or you say World Cup and World Cup. And I think by selecting one, you're you're sending a message to not just the athletes, but the world that, you know, it's it's almost second tier. And and here's something I had to write it. This is a great t-shirt that I, I love women that are wearing today, female athlete with female crossed out. It is exactly that point. When I played ice hockey, oh you're a great women's hockey player. No, I'm a great hockey player. Like that, I think, is the, the context of the conversation. And language sends a message. Um, recently, the Ski Federation dropped ladies and turned it into to women's skiing. So again, federations, international sport is understanding that language actually plays a part in this conversation. And we're doing our best to change that, that narrative. It has to be said that perhaps when it comes to football, Maggie, we're still a, a way away from that. Do you think... Anything similar to this is going to happen anytime soon? Or are we going to have women's football in the UK for, for quite some time yet? Yeah, I think it's still going to take a little while. I mean, football in this country is still seen as, by default, men's football. Uh, and women's football is a bit of a tack on. Um, as Angela mentioned, you know, it's different in the US. So uh, the context, it, it really, really matters. I think something that's interesting for us, we actually sell in our club shop uh, T-shirts a pair and one says uh, footballer and one says male footballer and that's just <laughs> to make the point uh, you know just to just to put it out there and just say look uh, let's rethink the conversation let's rethink how we talk about these types of things and yeah it is important what I don't want is for there to be such a conversation about uh, the language that we forget about the conversation about investment and how decisions are made and how uh, diverse the boards are that dis make the decisions about broadcast, about sponsorship, um, about the rules of the game. So th the language is super important, but it's really important also to, to understand that that's a reflection of society. So it's a good marker, right? It's a good mm -hmm. marker for us to hopefully look back in a few years and go, oh, do you remember when we used to say female footballer or women's World Cup? Uh, so hopefully we won't need it any it, for, for that much longer, I guess. I, I think that's oh, a good you. point. Around, sorry. Just Karen, the, Angela, sorry, you go. The, the, the leadership, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. All these things we're talking about, sponsorship, media, rights holders, federation 
we need more women at the top. At the end of the day, those are the people that are making the investment decision. Those are the people that are holding each other accountable, that trickle on effect. So I, I just have to underscore that point about leadership. And we're seeing more women at the top. It's slowly changing, but at least we're seeing some traction. And I would just say that that to me is the one thing I would I would advocate more of. <laughs> Everything else will follow. <laughs> Does that change need to be, I mean, like you say, you, we need more women at the top. Sue, is that a change that you have started to see? Because I know in your Game Changers podcast as well, you talk to women that have come through the ranks yeah. and all areas of sport over the last couple of decades. It's slowly happening, isn't it? And a reason to be positive. Yes, it is. Yeah, slowly. Happening. And I think things like the um, the code for sports governance that the Sport England and UK Sport had three years ago, that's created a shift because they've set some quotas and, you know, we've said they, in order to get funding, you need to have 30 uh, percent of women. You know, your board needs to be made up of 30 uh, percent of one gender, uh, for, which has really helped in terms of getting more women. There are different ways to make that happen. I think it doesn't always work when people say we're going to set a target and we're, we hope to get there in the future. I think sometimes, you know, there needs to be uh, something a little bit more persuasive. And, and sometimes that's public opinion. Sometimes it's a reaction from sponsors. Sometimes it's about you know withholding funding. So. Sadly, it, it won't just happen in a trickle down way. If we anticipate it will do, it sometimes needs something more forceful to make that change. But yeah, better than it has been, uh, but still a long way to go. And it's one of those things as well that that progress will have not been stemmed by COVID, by the pandemic. That will continue. Let's take a okay. look then. We've finally closed our poll and see where we are in terms of how excited people are to watch women's sport as it begins to return. So we've asked, are you more or less likely to watch? as it returns from lockdown as we've mentioned we're seeing it coming back in the uk now 13 percent say you're more likely absence maybe made the heart grow fonder 42 percent less likely and for 45 percent of you it is the same so for those who are already watching women's sport i think you can safely assume that this gap this pause without any hasn't dulled the appetite we've got to start wrapping up but before we go i've got to ask each of you i'll start with you angela how does women's sport thrive out of this pandemic and are you optimistic um, just know that the rules are being rewritten and education is key. If you understand the fluid fan, the future fan, where they're open to change and power is constantly evolving, the old model, throw that out. Think about the new ways then, that you can do business as, a, as an entity. Um, I think women's sports is going to take a hit like all sports is going to take a hit. But use this flexibility, this nimbleness, invest in the right technology, do things better. You can get to the consumers in a much easier way now and take advantage of this opportunity, if anything. Maggie, how will Lewis FC be seizing this opportunity and growing post-COVID? Yeah, well, I agree. I think we have to rethink the rules in many ways. Uh, we have a, an opportunity as a nation, uh, as a sports community, where we can just carry on doing the same things we've always done and invest in men's sport first. And then if there's any pennies left over, we'll invest in women's. Or we could see this as an incredible opportunity to think about new ways of broadcast, invest there because people in that poll suggested that some people are maybe a little bit afraid about coming back out to watch sport okay well let's get it on tvs let's use this as an opportunity to think about all the all the opportunities that there are all the rules are broken we don't have to do things the way we've done them for decades we've got an absolute opportunity to change the rules just an interesting tweet pop up on that women's debate as to the, the language we use and saying it works without it in athletics, but team games are by default assumed to be the men's version. Definitely a, a point of view, Sue. I'm sure we want to work to change and we'll continue to work to change. Are you optimistic about how women's sport will recover from this period? I am. I am. I think uh, women's sports definitely seen research as it sh Nielsen research, I think a couple of years ago, women's sports seen as more progressive. It's cleaner. It's more family oriented. It's less money focused, more inspiring for women and girls. So I do think a lot of brands at the moment be looking at authenticity, transparency, you know, a slightly different place to where we were even a, a year or so ago. So I do think uh, all that women's sport brings will be very appealing to sponsors as we move forward. So yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for the future. Well, reasons to be cheerful, certainly, as we say, women's sport is making a comeback and we've got plenty of it coming up for you on Sky Sports over the coming weeks, starting tomorrow with the ASI Ladies Scottish Open. That starts at midday on the Sky Sports Golf Red button. Then on the 20th of August, we've got the Women's Open for you. That all kicks off at 10.30 in the morning, August the 20th on Sky Sports Golf and on Sky Sports Mix. A little closer to now, though, 
Early hours of Saturday morning, late Friday night, it's turn for the WNBA Storm against the Wings, 1 a.m. on Sky Sports Arena and Sky Sports Mix. And it's not just live sport we've got for you on Sky Sports. We've got plenty of other content as well. Every Sunday at 9 a.m., we've got the Women's Football Show with Jess Creighton. Tune into that on Sky Sports Football. And we heard from her a little bit earlier, but if you want the full interview with Alice Deering and plenty more elite female athletes besides from across the sporting spectrum, make sure you check out The Check-In, which is available now on demand and on YouTube. And on Friday, we've got off the court our weekly, bi-weekly netball show, this time with Lisa Alexander. That's at three o'clock in the afternoon on Sky Sports Arena. And we've mentioned boxing quite a lot this evening with Jonas and Harper last week. But it's time for the ladies to go box office on August the 22nd. Katie Taylor will take on Delphine Pearson. All the build-up for that starts at 7 p.m. Well... It's been an interesting couple of hours, a healthy debate. My huge thanks to Angela Ruggiero, to Maggie Murphy, Sue Anstis and Dan Ryan beforehand. Women's sport, it seems, will bounce back. Keep telling the stories, keep rewriting the rule books, and we'll see you soon. Sky Sports Action. Feel it all.